Paper Mario Sticker Star was the most disappointing thing since online Smash Brothers. It's downright impressive how this game understands nothing about why people like RPGs and how much it botches being a follow-up to Super Paper Mario. And the worst thing is that this game ushered in a new era of mediocrity that denies the old Paper Mario from continuing. That's what stings so bad. Ten years later, this new Paper Mario refuses to go home. It's not just one substandard game. It's an influential bad game that won't stop infecting other better games that had potential. Even if the newer ones are better, they're still held back by terrible decisions that have stuck around for God knows why. And with Mario and Luigi seemingly dead, one of my favorite series of all time is just kinda sat on while the publisher keeps pretending this is what Paper Mario is. This is going to be kinda long, a multiple parter for sure. I want to preface this by saying I have no ill will toward anyone who made this game. I wasn't there to watch development unfold. Super Paper Mario had a mixed reception, so a lot of staff stepped down. Sticker Star took almost five years to develop. It lost its series director somewhere along the line. It was developed by new hires who were given the reins to a big name, and restarted development from scratch to drastically change direction. That is a taxing development period for any team, and would be incredibly challenging to work with. And I want to make this clear. No one person ruined this game, as much as people love to find a face for their dartboard. You want to know who said this game sucked? Shigeru Miyamoto and Kensuke Tanabe. Seriously, everyone loves to point at Miyamoto's quote where he asked them to try creating a game without new characters, but I never see anybody report on the part where he played the near final product and said it was boring. This story was told to us by Kensuke Tanabe himself, who went into how demoralizing of an experience it was. Let's stop blaming one person for everything wrong with a massive collaborative effort, because it simply isn't true. These two people aren't evil supervillains who hate fun. I didn't want to be so down on this game either. I bought Sticker Star on release as a fan of the first three games in the series. Sticker Star was my most anticipated game of 2012, and I wanted to enjoy it. Yes, some other game might be objectively worse, but I don't care about some obscure low-budget asset flip that I didn't buy. This was something I cared about and wanted to be good. I waited five years for it, and that's why I consider this to be the worst video game I've ever played. And I'm not a real negative person. I almost exclusively make videos about how much I like games. And I'm making this video partly because I don't want to be so negative. I have so much to say about it, and it comes up so often that I want something that I can point people to that has all my thoughts in one place. I like to talk about the positives. If you managed to enjoy Sticker Star, I wish I could too. And on that note, so that we don't entirely berate this game this entire time, let's start out with the positives. Because even I have to admit, there are some positive qualities to Paper Mario Sticker Star. So, here we go! The 1% of Sticker Star that was actually good! Number one, please! Go listen to the amazing music. Some people don't feel the jazzy and brassy thing that permeates the whole soundtrack, and I get it. The earlier soundtracks exceed the later ones for me due to more variety in the musical styles. But that doesn't mean this new music is terrible. Some choice examples are the hub world feeling friendly and inviting. Bustly feel of Decalberg. <laughs> the fight with Gooper Blooper. And pretty much every track in World 4. Yeah, isn't that 
fine feeling. Ugh, I love the music. Number two, speaking of the soundtrack, the title screen is my single favorite part of the entire gameplay experience. It's got a great song. Mario running around with Kirsty is cute and it just feels good to sit back and watch. It does a good job making you think this won't be so bad. Heck, I even got a little emotional at the Thousand Year Door font being the first thing you see when booting it up for the first time. After five years without a new Paper Mario, it brought me back in a way that I didn't think a friggin' font could. Number three, building off what I was saying earlier, chapter four is good, like really good. We'll go into detail later when we actually get to talking about chapter four, but it warrants bringing up in this list. If the rest of the game was as good as this, I might not mind the changes so much. Okay, some areas in it still suck, but mostly it's good. Number four. This is one of the best examples of the 3D on the 3DS. It's designed like a paper diorama and tilting the system makes the head elements hanging from the top move around. And the foil stickers shine in the light when the system is tilted too. I was impressed the first time I noticed that. It's a nice detail that shows some people working on this did legitimately care. Number five. I like... Um... How they redesigned the Koopas instead of exclusively flipping Thousand Year Door art like they did for everything else. The Koopas look pretty off model with a dead eyed stare in Thousand Year Door, so good initiative! Legitimate improvement over the old games. It's the only design improvement I can think of, but it's something. Yeah, this game sucks. Now, do you have the time to listen to me whine? about nothing and everything all at once. Number one, the story. Following Thursday. That's it! Story over! Number two. Okay, never mind. Let's use a numbering system like the real Paper Mario. Chapter one! A not that terrible beginning! So let's talk about what's so cheap about everything we just saw and break down the exposition first before we get into the actual game. Any semblance of story and characterization? The short answer, no. We've already seen all the story this game has to offer in the first 30 seconds. It really is just, Bowser broke the thing, go get it back. I don't think it's unfair to expect some level of grandness when this game is marketing itself as a sequel to the original trilogy, and we hadn't seen anything else but epic high stakes plots at the time it released. I get maybe not wanting to make another game about something as heavy as the inevitability of the apocalypse. As much as I liked it, I'm sure some people found the story of the third game to be a bit much. But you don't have to go this direction to avoid that. The first Paper Mario had an admittedly simple blueprint for a story, not straying too far from what Mario usually is. But there, we had unique characters, minor subplots, fun and memorable villains and a world that felt like much more than a bunch of levels in a video game. Spectacle in Bowser straight up carrying Peach's whole castle into outer space and laughing at anything Mario could do to him. While the threat looms that Bowser can just wish for anything he wants and has already taken over whole sections of the world. This is nothing but the first game story, but worse in every possible way. And speaking of Bowser, I think he was the character who has done the most dirty here. Bowser is never allowed to say one word in the entire game. Not. Allowed. Kirsty's stealing his lines in this footage. He has no character other than stole the sticker comet. Everyone loves Bowser. 
He's well written in Odyssey and Sunshine. He's well written in Mario Party. He's well written in sports games, in Mario and Luigi, in Super Mario RPG, in a friggin' parental controls video. Even Tetris Attack had good lines for Bowser. He's hands down one of the greatest, funniest, and most beloved supervillains of all time. All while having legitimate cool factor. You might say that Mario games aren't big on story, but a Bowser with no personality is a huge letdown for any Mario game. And it's so egregious that this is happening in a whole sub-series of games built on its characters and writing. Also, yeah, it's called the Sticker Comet, not the Sticker Star. Sure. Man, every time I play this, I wish I was playing the Thousand Day Window instead. Well, actually, no. Sometimes it is called the Sticker Star. So when it comes to the characters and story, everyone knows about that interview. You know the one where they said that the Club Nintendo survey for Super Paper Mario said not even 1% of customers thought the story was interesting. I decided to do some digging as well as ask you guys about this, and this logic hasn't been used in any other publicly known instance in Nintendo's history. I'm certain Club Nintendo data was referenced during development lots of times, but no other Nintendo series has ever changed its entire identity on a dime over a customer survey. Plus, it's completely terrible logic. If the feedback was the story wasn't interesting in a successful series that was predicated on story, then wouldn't logic be to improve upon your work and make an interesting story? Rather than just throw your arms up and go, the people have spoken, they want no effort. It's a leap of logic for sure. But you listen to this survey as gospel and said, we ditched the story because it's what the fans wanted. But you don't listen to the sheer tidal wave of comments begging for the old style to return after you failed. You'll find no shortage of people anywhere else telling you the story wasn't the issue. The only fans they were listening to were made of paper! Also, I'm pretty sure Club Nintendo died shortly after this game's release because it was a completely terrible way of collecting feedback. You only needed a serial number to participate in the surveys. Actually, playing the game wasn't a requirement. I think people mostly wanted free stuff from completing a ton of surveys about games they never played, and just input whatever to get their points as fast as possible before the due date rolled around for the prizes. I found an archive of Club Nintendo surveys, and the interface for the questions was a scale of 1 to 7, with 1, or least interesting, at the top. So these surveys were greatly weighted to people just saying everything sucked if they thoughtlessly click through it to get free items. Gosh, if Nintendo ever gets hacked again, it would be really funny if someone published the results to this survey. So after the story starts, and finishes, we wake up with a hangover in Dekelberg. We get yelled at by Kirsty, who will be making our life hell for the next four to six weeks as she travels with us. It's her duty to fix the sticker stomach, and we gotta help her. This is our hub town and our first taste of gameplay, running around playing hide and seek with toads that Bowser scattered. But okay, plenty of great games have slow beginnings, and this is a better start than a lot of games that I've gone on to enjoy. Seriously. The toads have well-written dialogue, the town is pretty well-designed to let you figure out how jumping and hammering are used to solve problems, and that secrets will be hidden everywhere if you look. We end this on a toad getting buried under the fountain, something we can do nothing about yet, but it's a pretty weird moment that stuck with me and made me want to come back and help him once I knew how. Out on the map screen? Cool! A non-linear game, right? Wrong. The freedom to work on worlds out of order is an illusion. You need a poison mushroom from the end of World 1 to enter World 2, and the trumpet from the end of World 1 to start World 3. You can't actually stop working on one world and go hang out in another one for a while for the sake of variety until much later. So, why start the map off looking like this? It's lying to you. Some people take up issue with there being a map screen at all when a big interconnected world was cooler, but I'll give this a pass. It's portable, and having clear stopping points is nice when you're on the go. So let's go through this one level at a time, starting with the warm, fuzzy plains. So here we get our taste of a series first, Bowser Jr. I was pretty excited to see what they were gonna do with him in the Paper Mario series. Who doesn't love that Nyargle Bargle that graces his luscious lips? 
I think bringing him in was a great choice with loads of potential. Too bad they do next to nothing with it. We get our first taste of paperization here too. This is where you take pieces of paper and stick them to the environment to complete something, which was the thing that drew my eye the most before the initial release. Uh, I remember being physically in the audience the day they announced this game. This Paper Mario retains all the fun of the originals, but with even more game depth. The idea of sticking stickers on the environment and it actually blending with it is a super cool idea. It's just, give it time and it'll go downhill. This place shows off the gameplay pretty well, and Bowser Jr. being introduced as a character at least had me intrigued into where it was all going the first time. We also escorted Toad around. Get used to that. This Toad was all over the marketing and fooled everyone into thinking that partners were coming back. Even earlier footage showed Mario fighting with a chain chomp behind him, so we all thought partners were officially back until the day the game came out. You're the closest thing I have to a partner in this sad world. One, two, Bouquet Gardens. Number two picks up where number one left off, and I ain't talking about in the toilet. And here we learn some important things about the new Paper Mario. Your stickers aren't just for battle, but also solving puzzles. You'll be finding HP power-ups on the ground instead of through battling. And money solves all your problems. This is where the cracks start to show and the things that are most talked about start showing up. But honestly, my first time, I hadn't noticed yet. I found things charming enough and the new gameplay mechanics interesting, so I didn't yet notice I wasn't leveling up. Oh yeah, this level ends in a boss fight that's sort of memorable, I guess. One, three, Water's Edgeway. So we ran into the same toad again. You gonna tell us your name, buddy? No? Um, okay. Bye. So anyway, Kamek shows up and screws with us. We fight him, it's pretty uninteresting. And we go about fixing the goal and running into lots of enemies along the way. This is a minor point, but now that we're getting into some more battles, why do I even need stickers to fight at all? They say enemies have sticker power and we need to match their power, but I jump on enemies in the field and still hurt them just fine. Not major, but something I noticed after playing this game long enough. I'm intending to do overviews of every single level because I have complaints about pretty much all of them, but some like this one are just inoffensive and boring, so I'll gloss over them mostly whenever that happens. If something good comes up, I'll mention it but it'll be rare. 1-4, I read that as something else. So this place is the only location in this lame iteration of the Mushroom Kingdom I would call iconic. It's been a stage in Super Smash Brothers, and generally it's seen in a lot of promotional material, so it must have some big significance, right? Nah, it's just another place. A windmill we can do nothing with. There's gotta be a way to turn those blades. Here's our introduction to things and how they work. These are real-world objects hidden throughout the game's world and are referred to as, well, things. These are screen nukes for enemies, weaknesses of bosses, and your way of solving puzzles. For instance, a fire would naturally be extinguished by a rubber duck. In their default state, things are not usable. You must take a thing to a shop called Sling a Thing in the hub town in order to convert it into a sticker. But that's not so bad since our roadblock is at the start of the level. My first experience with Sticker Star was an onstage demo at PAX West, and it showed this section of the game and kept the inside of the windmill a mystery for the full experience. This is all that was in there. I remember being amazed by this concept of sticking stickers on the environment and actually working as expected. It immediately brought to mind Okami and how drawing on the world works there. So going into this, I saw it was turn-based battles like the first two games. The series had done no wrong before, and now paperization looked this cool? Oh my god. This new game is literally Thousand Year Door plus Okami! Oh, how young and full of a hope we all were. When it comes to puzzles, there's checks for thing stickers everywhere. Like I said, it's not a problem in this first instance, but they frequently put checks at the ends of levels. A thing in 1-2 could open something in 4-3, and the game won't tell you. There's no indication of what stickers you're gonna need for a level before you run through it, where the thing is to make that sticker, and in some cases, the game isn't clear about which thing you need even after you've run into the dead end. Tell me, what do I need to do here? The answer was, oh, tape the door shut, of course. 
Logic would say to take all of your things and convert them into stickers as soon as you get them. My fault for not being prepared, right? Well, nah. Thing stickers take up so much room that they leave you no room for anything else after only a few of them. And there's a grand total of 64 things, any of which could be the solution to any problem at any time. Why do we even need to convert these into stickers to use them? I have the thing with me and I see the things functioning in the field when I collect them. Just let me plop it down. It hurts so much worse than anything else when it's right there in the inventory, but not in a usable state. I can understand having to convert them to use them in battle since it'd be overpowered to have a ton of these effects, but why not for solving puzzles? I found the item you wanted me to find. I was diligent, so let me use it. It's punishing the player for being smart with their inventory management with a chance of rewarding the player for being reckless with it. Now for things in battle. Thing stickers will usually nuke a screen of regular enemies with some humorous animation. Next is the action commands for thing stickers. Oh yeah. They have action commands. That's something I bet a good chunk of you didn't know because the game never tells you and there's no on-screen cues to make you think so whatsoever. I played through the entire game without knowing that because it just looks like a cutscene is playing out and it was doing hundreds of damage anyway, so I had no reason to believe my attacks were weak and could become stronger. Almost all the thing stickers have the same action command, mash A. There are a select few exceptions to this that involve pressing A at the right time, like a squirt gun, which is admittedly pretty cool if you've never tried it, but mostly all of them have the same one. I have a story about a thing sticker in a battle from a friend of mine. He got the cake sticker and brought it with him to the final battle of the game because he expected it to be a great healing item. He used it, the cake sat there for a few seconds, and then it poofed away without doing anything. What the hell? It was cryptic to a whole new level. Was that supposed to heal me? This was the only instance in the entire game of having to blow into the microphone for the action command. Cause candles. You have to blow the mic? And all because he didn't read the game's mind, he wasted his turn when he needed healing the most, and died right when he was about to win, but needed to heal first. Ah! Just... why? Would it have killed them to put one line of text on the screen telling you what the action commands are? You know, like they did just fine since 1999? In fact, they did it just fine in this game too. Regular stickers have descriptions, thing stickers don't. There's no excuse. So thing stickers, while charming in concept, end up being frustrating because of cryptic puzzle solutions, cryptic uses in battle, and the fact that unless you're psychic, you could be throwing away the solution to the next roadblock at any moment. Oh, and this level's over pretty quickly after we open the windmill. It's not really much at all. 1-5, Wamino Mountain. It's so cool this came back. I just wish it was in a better game. things and then it's over but it's great Goomba's fortress the end of this world our big showdown with a big boss our big first dungeon oh hi Luigi I adore you in every other Mario RPG you're one of the most interesting characters and I usually feel sympathetic toward oh bye sheesh was his problem now that we have the trumpet and the poison mushrooms from this level, we are free to begin chapter two or three, if we so wish, right before fighting the boss anyway. One of the few times the game is actually non-linear rather than just pretending that it is. I can appreciate linearity in games. It can work particularly well in story-driven moments or make the atmosphere immersive to convey what a character is feeling. 
I only bring it up because this game presents itself like you can do whatever you want, but really, you can't most of the time. Here's our first boss! And they suck. Every boss fight sucks. Each boss gives you two options. Either use the thing sticker they're weak to, which slays them in one hit, or actually play these 300 HP Snorefests 10 damage at a time. My first playthrough, I was unsatisfied by destroying him in one turn. So I reset due to it leaving a bad taste in my mouth. It took me seven minutes of doing perfect action commands to chip down this health bar for the first boss. Many later bosses sport several hundred HP to illustrate just how bad this is. You only have bad options. You will either be miserable or slaying the bosses in one to two turns. It manages to be both ways that a boss fight can be ruined at the same time. It was also the event that caused me to realize that if you ever run out of stickers, the game just keeps handing you more. Frequently it grants mushrooms in this way, making death pretty much impossible if the enemy isn't nuking you. And like I said, nearly every boss fight is like this. I would consider almost any boss in this game a serious candidate for the worst boss fight in any Nintendo game. To the game's credit, because they have you trying to figure out what the sticker the boss is weak to, they enable you to run away from the boss fight and try them again, which is a pretty nifty idea I haven't seen done before, and it makes sense for what they were going for. It might have been better to just create a better structure for the boss fights to follow, but hey, it's genuinely a thoughtful feature to include. However, because something just has to drag down my one compliment, remember when I said that I reset the boss fight? That was when I learned this game doesn't have a soft reset programmed in. I am hitting LR start select in this footage and nothing. It's the only 3DS game I've ever seen that's this way, and it's kind of worse than it would be for your average game when so many parts of this game are guess the correct sticker to progress. You have to fully turn off the game and then start it up again. <laughs> and not only that, if you somehow win the fight without the boss's weakness, Kirsty actually has the gall to pop out of your little hat and condescendingly tell you to try harder. I didn't even know this until doing research for this video, but she actually says it even if you win in one turn, all because it wasn't with the sticker the developers intended. That's right, Kirsty calls you stupid for thinking. A condescending helper character is a kiss of death for your game, but man, this is next level. With us reaching the end of chapter one, I think we're gonna stop there, and next time, we'll cover chapter two. With that, I leave you with my reaction when I pop this cartridge in for the first time. Ha! <laughs> this used copy of Sticker Star only played the game for an hour before trading it in. <laughs> I call it the definitive experience.